Last week I was thinking about this statue. It's one of a pair that I own, but this one is my favorite. And I decided it would be the subject of my next painting. It's a statue of a girl. Others have argued with me about the figure's gender, but if you look at the face, the features are very feminine, especially the eyebrows and lips. I think the hair is too long or curled, at least for a boy who is reasonably groomed. The figure, especially the abdomen, is feminine. Is that post-sex bloating, or is she maybe even pregnant? Perhaps the artist's model is a bit more mature than the character depicted in the sculpture. The pose with the hands behind the head is a common trope in glamour photography even today, and classically feminine. The pose is submissive, alluring, even enticing. The statue, it seems to me, is not that of a boy, but a tomboy. Maybe that's what intrigues me about this figure, the juxtaposition of both masculine and feminine, the ambiguity, the suggested pose, the subtle, even subliminal eroticism. Is it possible that the artist is trying to convey adult ideas, tap into adult sexual feelings through these child images, or am I reading too much into it? Let's look at its companion piece. This one is unmistakably female. Both statues are of young children outside, happy and smiling, enjoying the simple childhood pleasure of bare feet on soft green grass. The girl has one hand shielding her eyes from the sun. She's holding her skirt up in front, perhaps to protect her from getting dirty on the ground, or maybe she's just going wading in the nearby pond, or maybe it's just to show a little leg and invite the viewer's imagination inside like a forbidden doorway that should not be entered. I wish the artist was still around. I'd like to ask him about it. Whatever the case may be, I find them both very interesting, but the tomboy is a perfect study. Whether the eroticism is intentional, accidental, or just in my somewhat twisted imagination. Not that I have anything against eroticism, subtle or otherwise. As an artist, I've used it myself. It's provided me with some very surreal images in my paintings and in my films as well, from simple figure studies to fantasy to shame to such so-called aberrations as sadism, masochism, 
even the horror of violence and death can be viewed as sexuality. I've done a lot of horror movies, not intensely surreal like my other film work, but I believe horror movies are inherently surreal. Surrealism, at least visually, is the juxtaposition of incongruent images. I believe that's the standard definition. Now you take something like, oh, let's say zombies. Here you have the dead rising out of the grave at night, stumbling around mindlessly and killing the living. That's pretty incongruent if you ask me. Vampires are a close cousin, naturally, and werewolves. Slashers are surreal, and and so on. Of course, Stephen King wrote a novel about a killer, 1958 Plymouth Fury. That is surreal. These statues were made back in the first part of the 20th century by a company by the name of El Pellegrini and Company that made chalkware, which is a fancy word for molded plaster. The mold was made of an original sculpture. The plaster was molded, painted with oils, and varnished. They were in business until at least 1922, based on this copyright notice. But beyond that, I've been unable to find any information about them. They made small decorative pieces that were often sold as carnival prizes, specifically called carnival chalk before today's cheap imported stuffed animals took over. A lot of Pellegrini's items seem to have been religious themed, but there were also some more casually themed items like my statues. Statues are also a bit larger than the others I've seen, standing 22 inches tall. Maybe they started making them smaller for some reason afterward, like cost, but that's only speculation. And I don't assume that Pellegrini was actually the artist, but it is possible. Or maybe he just owned the company. Who knows? Something about the second piece has always bothered me. The head seems to be too big for the shoulders. It almost looks like a caricature. The varnish on these pieces has darkened over the last century or so, also muting the colors. I'm going to try to bring back some of that vibrance, the way I imagine it would have been, especially if it is carnival chalk. The brighter colors are more eye-catching, of course, and that draws customers. I won't go into these subliminals again, but take it for what you will. In the 17th century came the Age of Enlightenment. Humanity made advances in religion, philosophy, science. The ideas of freedom and liberty became more liberal and concrete. New, fresh thinking and ways of thinking swept over Europe, with advancements continuing throughout the 18th century. With this advanced thinking came the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution and advances in technology. Both eras came to an end about the same time in the early 20th century, and the age of technology began and is still going strong. As I speak these words, we are planning on going to Mars. I find that truly amazing. But also in 1904, when my statues were copyrighted, the Industrial Revolution was coming to an end, and the Western world was just beginning to heal itself of the Victorian era when homosexuality, or more accurately, sodomy and prostitution were prosecuted rigorously thanks to what we now see as antiquated moral views. It was that era when poets started speaking in terms of flowers and sunny days when referring to love and even sex, insinuating rather than speaking plainly under threat of being criticized for having more morals and even being somehow evil. Not that they didn't have erotica during the Victorian era, but it was, as it is today, generally kept secret and in private. Perhaps that could explain the subtle eroticism in my statues, if it is, in fact, there at all. 
The Enlightenment, Industrial Revolution, and Victorian work ethics combined to make Great Britain a leader in the global economy. It also resulted in extensive use of child labor, though to their credit, I suppose, there was a movement towards ending animal cruelty. I suppose they had their own priorities. I mean, all that free thinking and Victorian moral rigidity happened during the last half of the Industrial Revolution, which started in Britain and spread across Central Europe. Maybe that growth spurt was what caught Pellegrini's eye, and he started making his chalkware. My research tells me the name Pellegrini originated in Sicily. Italy didn't particularly industrialize, but maybe he picked up on the idea of filtering in from neighboring Austria-Hungary and emigrated to the United States to start his business. I assume that maybe that's where he set up shop since most of the Pellegrini pieces I found are located here in the States. Again, I only assume, but it's possible. He remains elusive, a mystery, an enigma. More than 110 years have passed, Mr. Pellegrini, almost 120 as I speak, since these works of yours came into being. In a few short years, technology would change. The advent of radio and the commercialization of cinema would change the way we are entertained. The coming of the jazz age would lead to big bands, the blues, rock, and others, and would also help change our lives forever by changing society as a whole. So what happened, Mr. Pellegrini? Did you hop on a boat and head to the New World? Were you among the millions who passed through immigration at Ellis Island? Is New York perhaps where you had your workshop? Why are you so invisible? Why is your history lost in the centuries since you created these works? Were you swept up in the advancement of civilization and passed over by the changes in technology? Did life change without you? Did it leave you behind? Are these your pieces of art, your only epitaph, the monument to your memory? Surely it must lie somewhere, but where? I sense hidden tragedy in your story's end, and it makes me sad. As an artist, I'm a hybrid of surrealist, impressionist, and expressionist. I wasn't really satisfied with the way this turned out. I think I got the legs too short, but I'm not happy with the face. But a work of art is intended to express a thought or elicit an emotion. Once it accomplishes that, the work is finished, and any further work is wasted effort. Well, it accomplishes its purpose, and I'm happy with it. So here's to you, Mr. Pellegrini. Mr. L. Pellegrini. Let this painting of mine add a footnote to your all too meager legacy. The work is done but not complete. Not until something, someone, brings your story out of the darkness of the past. Your servant, sir. <laughs>